Welcome. Hi. Excellent. And uh, yeah, welcome to, to everyone joining us again. Uh, greetings and thank you for tuning in. Um, so first off, just quickly getting it out of the way, this will be our final webinar for the year. Um, and what a year it has been. The, uh, the webinar Dream Destination Series is not coming to an end. Um, that's the good news. We will return once again with the webinars from the 6th of January. Uh, but yeah, we're just taking some time off over the festive season. Um, but yeah, 6th of January, uh, Lev Fred will be uh, back then and he'll be showcasing the wonders of Canada during winter uh, with a special emphasis on owls. So today, uh, remarkably, is actually our 27th webinar in our Dream Destination series. And uh, on behalf of everyone at Rock Jumper, uh, Nikki and I wanted to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all of your support this year. Uh, we know it's been a trying support for everybody. Um, and we really, we really, um, yeah, wanted to say thank you. Uh, it means a lot. Um, but yeah, when we thought of these offerings, um, for these webinars back in May, we had really no idea that they would have the impact that it had. Um, and nor did we ever conceive that the number of viewers joining us every week would be as high as it is. Uh, it's been quite remarkable to see. Um, but yeah, it's been very, very special for, for all of us. And uh, yeah, we thank you all for joining us again. Right, on to this week's webinar. And uh, joining us today from the UK is Rock Jumper Tour leader, Rob Williams. Uh, many of you will have fun memories of Rob's standout Northern Peru webinar back in late August, where he showcased an incredible volume of mouth-watering species in that part of the world. Uh, this time around, he focuses on one of Europe's finest birding countries, Spain. Uh, there's a lot to love about this historically rich country with varied wildlife, food, culture, wine, uh, favorable climate, and, uh, and really scenic countryside as well. I know Nikki, uh, Rob and I are very excited to get started. So without further ado, the virtual floor is yours, Rob. Thank you very much, Keith. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, um, wherever you are in the world. It's just dusk here in a cold, chilly British evening. And um, it's nice to be talking about somewhere hot and exciting. So Spain's one of my favorite countries. I've had the great fortune to live there three times, uh, working twice as a biologist and once studying. So um, it's a country I, I know quite well and I still love going back to. And so I'm looking forward to taking on a quick journey around Spain based on the, the main birding tour that Rock Jumper offers, which runs in May each year. That's, I'm gonna basically follow the itinerary. So here we go. Um, let's see if we can. Why is that not? Ah. Um, hang on a second. There we go. <clears throat> so here's a map of Europe, a satellite image of Europe, and there's the Iberian Peninsula down in the bottom left. And you can see just how big it is. Obviously, most of the Iberian Peninsula is, is formed by Spain. And you can also see, in contrast to most of Europe, which is a pretty solid green color, uh, Spain has some pretty arid areas that are showing in kind of sandy colors. The other thing to note is just how close it is to Africa. And um, so Spain is Europe, you know, southwestern Europe. It's one of the wildest countries in Europe, but it's also got a little tinge of kind of Africa to it. Um, and that's very important, especially in migration. And this is a very key factor in the timing of the the Rock Jumper Tour. Here I've got two maps, the smaller one showing sort of global main migration routes, and then the large one focusing on the Africa, the Palearctic migration routes. And you can see the green going through Elat, Israel, etc., is one of the main migration routes. And then there's various ways to get across the Mediterranean for these birds, either go round via Elat or up through Italy, the blue route, or taking the reddish route across the Strait of Gibraltar. And because that is such a narrow meeting of two areas, there's an incredible flow of birds up there. It also, for a lot of the species that don't really like going over the Sahara, prefer to follow around the coast, that's where they naturally get brought up to. So in Western Europe, the most important migratory route is right there. And the Spain tour is timed for that. 
Here's a little bit of the geography of Spain, just to show some of the key features. The red areas are the higher lands and the bluer areas are the lowest. So you can see that um, right up at the north, we've got the Pyrenees on the border with France. Then in the middle, you've got this area of highlands, a sort of central upland plateau in the, the north center of Spain. And then down towards the south, we've got other mountains of Andalusia and some big river valleys. So that's just giving you a bit of a quick geographic overview. Um, and what that means, that geography means you've got an awful lot of different habitats because you've got these different elevations, we've got different climatic influences from the Mediterranean, from the Atlantic, which produces a lot of different ecosystems and, um, and the, the mountains being uh, east-west running rather than north-south like the Rockies tend to get end endemisms because they're cut off. Um, and so it has a staggering number of birds for, uh, for the latitude it's at, and um, in a European context especially, with 598 species recorded, of which 387 are regularly found there. Spain does have seven endemics. There are six on the Canary Islands and one on the Balearic Islands. Those birds aren't seen on this tour because we focus on the mainland. Um, but there are other tours that go to the Canaries as a kind of Macronesia tour that offers those birds. Um, and Spain has some of the largest areas of wilderness remaining in Europe, which is also very important. So we've got some really great bits of habitat um, with still large mammals, etc. So here's a map of Spain showing the main areas that the tour visits. As an extension, there's a pre-tour extension there's five days in the Straits of Gibraltar area which I'll talk about in a minute and then the main tour starts in the city of Seville and first of all visits the Coto Doñana area before driving north up to Extremadura. This looks like quite a long way but one of the great things about Spain is in the last 20-30 years they've really developed very good road infrastructure. Uh, mostly through European Union membership, etc., supporting programs and things, but it really has transformed how you can get around Spain quickly. So that drive from Coro Doñana to Extra Madura, if you did it straight off, would be about four hours. So you know we do it in the middle of the day with a lunch stop. It's actually not too far. Then from a, after a few days in Extra Madura, we nip up to the Sierra de Grados, part of that central chain of mountains running through the middle of the of Spain. And then we jump on from there to a place called the Canyon de Doraton, a, a, a nice area in the steppe plateau, um, before we go up and hit two different areas in the Pyrenees for a number of days, which have got slightly different habitats. I'm going to talk about all these in a bit, so I'll be able to tell you more why we're going to these different ones. Finishing up on the Mediterranean coast at Barcelona. So that's the, the route of the tour, and this is a 15-day itinerary, basically. So let's start off with the extension. The extension is in the Straits of Gibraltar area. So you drop down a couple of hours' drive from Seville, which is the starting airport, and stay near the town of Tarifa that you can see there, right in the middle on the very southern tip of Europe. And we stay in a little hotel not far outside town. And the arrows I'm showing, the blue arrow, indicates that there's migration in and out of the Mediterranean in both ways when we're there in May. And the orange arrow indicates the, the primary migration coming north of birds. This visit is timed especially to try and see the honey buzzard migration, which is a, a, a key raptor. You get other species in with them. Um, but coming north. And you'll see in northern Morocco, I've, I've marked Jebel Musa, which is the highest mountain there. And the birds basically build up on that and then migrate across the Straits of Gibraltar. And depending which way the wind is, it takes them either west or east. And so you move to, we move to different areas along the coast there to try and pick up the migrants as they're coming in. Um, Amazingly, even in May, there are already some birds, especially non-breeders of some raptor species, that are already heading back south. So the yellow, owl, the yellow arrow signifies uh, a slight movement of birds going back south. And we basically spend our, our five days in this area 
um, never sort of really trying to go too far away, sort of watching the wind, listening out for what's been seen in terms of migrants, and then we can get into an optimal position. This is the kind of view we get. This is uh, from a bit north of, of Tarifa. You can see actually see Tarifa lighthouse on Tarifa Island in the, the upper left in front of Jebel Musa, the, the dark mountain on the, in, in Morocco that's looking across the strait, basically. So we're a bit north along the coast looking. You've got lovely sandy beaches and Mediterranean scrub areas and actually a, a Roman ruin, an old fortified Roman town that was a, an important fishing port for the tuna migration uh, down there, just this side of the little wetland. Um, and so this is one of the birds we're really trying to get to see. It's good numbers of honey buzzards. This is a nice dark adult male. Uh, you can tell it's an adult male by the, the amount of sort of space on the wings. Females tend to um, are more barred. The males have these bigger gaps between the barring. They have these kind of translucent panel in the primaries. And then here's a classic, sort of more classic male. Again, lots of space in the wings telling you it's a male, but this is a sort of more normal coloured. And then there are also paler ones, so we see dark ones, pale ones, uh, different ages, different sexes, so it's, it's really entertaining spending some time looking at, at honey buzzard plumages. And then amongst them we see a few things like uh, short-toed snake eagles, often non-breeders heading back uh, across the channel. So, and uh, also we've got seabirds moving in and out of the Mediterranean. At this time of year, it's very interesting because the Balearic shearwaters, which is an endangered species, only breeds on the Balearic Islands, have finished breeding already by early May, and they're heading out into the Atlantic. And the Scopoli shearwaters are heading into the Mediterranean to breed from the Atlantic. And so you see both these, these classic Mediterranean shearwaters, and sometimes with the Scopolis, there's a few Cori shearwaters caught up in with them. So we look through those and we actually take a boat trip one hour afternoon out and um, it's mainly a whale watching trip, but it's great for watching seabirds. Often see short fin pilot whales. Last time we were there, we saw sperm whale as well. So really interesting time on right on the straits there. Then just north of uh, the straits near the town of Barbate, we, there's a, a few colonies of northern bald ibis. This is one of the rarest birds in the world. It was reduced to just a few colonies in Morocco years ago and now has been reintroduced into Spain and is thriving. And we, so we head up and, and look at these amazing birds on their, their cliff nests. And it's a, one of the colonies in a very bizarre place right by a road. And, and the, the sort of trucks are going just under the nests. And there are these amazing birds which we can scope and get really good views of. So. Um, this area also has a number of other good species like Isabelline warbler that we perhaps won't find on the, the main tour. There's chances on the main tour, but it, it's better down here. Um, and Iberian chiffchaff, another one, an endemic or near endemic to, to Spain and quite a patchy distribution in Spain. We do go past a couple of spots on the main tour where we could see it, but um, it's slightly easier down here and we always try and seek it out on the extension. Um, this is one of the latest migrants to arrive, the rufous-tailed scrub robin. And the timing of the tour usually just allows us to get some of the first arrivals. Um, with the, the whole tour is, is thought about and go, works the way it does to try and hit these key migration and, and also the the latest migrants coming in, but still a few of the late sort of winterers are still up north as well. So um, we'll make a concerted effort in an area of vineyards to look for rufous-tailed scrub robin. And uh, another one is white rump swift. It's a very late arrival, but usually we just manage to get the first couple uh, arriving on one of our days on the extension. Um, Slightly further north um, towards Seville, there's an area of wetlands and there's um, very good for white-headed duck. This is a species that was really endangered a few years ago, had a big problem with hybridization from uh, introduced ruddy ducks that have been reintroduced to the UK 
or had escaped in the UK and expanded their population. They, they've now been culled to hide, try and protect this bird. And it's doing quite well. And there's a few lagoons we'll go to and try and see this fantastic bird. We also stop in at the only European breeding colony of Little Swift at a, a fishing port in a place called Chipiona. And we usually see a few of those going in and out of the nests here with a nice throat full of food. And just north of that town, there's some great salt pans. And we'll spend one day looking at, at the birds on the salt pans, including a lot of pied avocets that allow really good looks. Um, little terns breeding there in between the salt pans and migrants like little stint again we're the timing we're a little we're getting a little late for most of the waders but there's usually a, a you know a reasonable number of most species still present uh the big peak has already probably gone but we we catch up when including up to sort of 50 60 little stints in a day and they're they're in pretty nice plumage by then as well also there is uh the fantastic slender bill gull it's one of my personal favorites it's such a delicate bird and often the uh, beautiful collared pratting coals um, flying overhead calling catching insects beautiful birds along the coast here we'll make some stops and look for Alduan's gull Alduan's gull is a real Iberian speciality and most of them breed in the Ebro Delta which this tour doesn't actually go to but there's always a few uh, birds along the coast here and we'll make sure we, we hit some of these sandy beaches and search out a few of this beautiful gull. From there, the main tour starts and we head to, um, to the beautiful Cota Doñana National Park. And we stay at the, the village of El Rocio, which is a, it's kind of got a, a slightly strange feeling. It almost looks like something out of the Wild West. It's sand, sandy streets, and it's got this big church in it right beside the marshes. Uh, it's a very important uh, religious site for many Catholics in southern Spain, and actually wider than that across southern Europe, people come there because a, a little girl in the marshes saw found a statue of the virgin in a in a tree many years ago and that statue is now uh in the in the church here and um but it's very very interesting little village and it's a great base to explore this i actually lived there a few years ago when i worked for the spanish ornithological society and the rspb on a project and um it really is a, a fantastic place. The, the village looks straight out over the, the Marismas, this huge flat plain with um, small flooded areas which teem with life. Absolutely incredible numbers of greater flamingos, you know, flocks of hundreds can be going over, uh, bobbing around over them the whole time are whiskered terns. And then within this huge area, there are a few little pools that are, have a slightly better vegetation and things and offer us chances for rare birds like marble duck. Um, this always takes a bit of searching, but um, usually with some good local knowledge and, um, and a bit of luck, we, we manage to get onto one. If we're really lucky, maybe ferruginous duck, but this is getting quite tricky now in Spain. Um, but some years we managed to find one. They can be at this time of year quite difficult breeding in tiny little pools in reedy areas and just getting in a flat landscape, getting the view into the areas can be quite challenging. Um, we also find Western Swamp Hen here in good numbers. And they're, they're always entertaining to watch as they tear up the typhoon and eat the bases, kind of dinosaur-like destruction of these big reeds. And in the reed beds, there are lots of herons, uh, big colonies of purple heron, uh, little bittern, can be seen here, uh, squawko heron as well. And a recent colonist to this area um, is an incredible story, really, is glossy ibis. They only started nesting here um in the mid early to mid 90s i think and now they are abundant there are some absolutely huge colonies um and then 
sometimes on tours, people, especially people from North America, tell me that North American warblers are better than European warblers, and that you know they're more fun to look at. But you've got to love something like this. This is great reed warbler. Uh, I mean, look at those subtle tones of brown and brown and grey and brown. Um, but no, a beautiful bird and a lovely song, and we see them quite well up in the reeds. Uh, not to be mistaken for the Savvy's Warbler, which looks completely different and is grey and brown and brown, and um, but has a very different call. Uh, sounds like a, a very fast fishing wheel being round in, wound in and is a really, really nice bird to actually sit and just watch it singing relentlessly. And that's going on at this time of year. It's, it's spring and everything's crazy, that everything's singing its heads off, so it's brilliant. Sometimes we get very lucky and find um, a, a rare crake or something. This is a Bayon's crake we saw on the tour a couple of years ago. They're here, numbers fluctuate from year to year. Where they are fluctuates from year to year. And so it's, it's a bit of a, a luck thing um, or hearing about one and getting there and managing to find it or hearing one calling. Um, but always, always fantastic if you do get one. This is also a very good area in the pine woodlands around um, Doniana to see the Iberian magpie. Um, used to be called the Azure Wing magpie, but that's the name now reserved for the form in China. And uh, amazing distribution of two sister species, one around Beijing in China and, and one in the Southern Iberian Peninsula. So, um, but yeah, we should see those. And there is a very slim outside chance of, of lynx in this area. I've seen it a couple of times on tours over the years, um, but it, it is a, a difficult um, animal to see. It's an absolutely fantastic animal. If anyone's really interested in lynx, then there is a, a birds, wine and lynx tour, which specifically targets several days in a, the Sierra de Anduja, which is probably the best place well, it's certainly the best place in Spain, in the world, to see Iberian lynx. And um, there are some lynx there that are relatively used to people and you, you watch for them with scopes. So if anyone really is interested in lynx, I would recommend looking, checking out that tour. Uh, it's a slightly shorter tour, but it goes to most of the areas in southern Spain. Uh, it runs in November, December time, which is a better time of year for seeing lynx. Um, and so we leave the Cota Doñana and the coastal area behind and we head north into Extremadura. Extremadura is the area in Spain where the conquistadors who came to South America came from. It's a, it's a very tough landscape. It's very cold in winter and very hot in, in July and August. And um, it's an agricultural landscape. And these, these guys came there and made their fortunes in South America. Um, mainly by stealing gold and silver and enslaving people, but um, they came back and they built some fairly amazing buildings. And this is the, the town square. There's Franco Pizarro, um, uh, Pizarro on his horse um, in the town square of Trujillo. And we go and we always, we usually have lunch in, in the square of Trujillo and have a look around. Because if you look up on top of the tower of the church, you can see the the white storks nests and this town these old buildings are phenomenal for a number of good bird species so there we'll we'll seek out the pallid swift um, which nests in the buildings amongst common swifts as well um, this is a great place to see a uh, rock dove and i know people might be laughing all around the world at me now um, talk about a rock dove but if you've only ever seen feral pigeon and anyone who's been on a tour with me may remember that I'm not a massive fan of feral pigeons and I have been known to call them a sky rat occasionally but here you get the genuine article the original rock dove and they are an absolutely beautiful thing and it's great you can you can take this one and take away all the guilt of the the rock doves you've had on your list for so long based on feral pigeons because this is the the real McCoy so that's that's nice to see um, lesser kestrels, there's quite a few pairs breed, especially in the, the walls of the bullring. Um, and we tend to go down out there and stand outside and get good views of this beautiful little colonial 
kestrel that breeds in buildings. Uh, Western jackdaw, always fun, characterful, ju jumping around on the roofs, the sound of these towns really, and the white storks. Um, when we're there, there's still a bit of displaying going on. Some of them have got quite large chicks. Um, so there's always a lot to watch with the white storks. So. But this, this town is surrounded by the steppe habitats. And this is a big open plain. It's now mostly agricultural land, but it's still very rich in, um, in other plant species. It's not just a monoculture crop. Um, especially areas which are being protected and the repayments to help maintain biodiversity because there are some phenomenal birds out here. Um, there's an awful lot of corn buntings. Um, actually, it looks like quite a boring bird. I, I love it. Um, it's got a lovely little song like jangling keys. It's also the only European bird that only has one plumage. Uh, they come out of the nest like that and they die looking like that. Males and females look like that. They look the same the whole life, which is kind of interesting when you think about how some other buntings look. Um, but that's not what we're here for. That'll just be the background. There's also calandra larks coming up out of the fields all over the place singing, occasionally landing on posts or rocks to sing, um, and several other species of larks. But we're really here for the bustards. And this is great bustard. And we are towards the end of the displaying season by now. They display pretty early in the year, but usually we manage to find some that are still strutting their stuff and get to see, get to see some display of this. But we see quite a few of these birds usually. Um, one very sad thing in a, in a way is it used to be this was the difficult bird to see. And while you were looking for the great busters, you saw loads of little busters. And it's, I bet Great Bustard hasn't become more common, but Little Bustard has undergone a catastrophic decline. This is the Little Bustard. Um, they are now quite tricky to find. Um, we're usually successful, but it usually takes quite a lot of perseverance uh, to find this absolutely beautiful bird. I mean, it's, it's a bit more tricky because they are little that one really doesn't give the scale so here's a picture by Yav that shows it you know there's a vehicle track going up through one of these fields you can see that actually they walk into that and they disappear um, so we listen out for their call and, uh, and usually find them in it but it, it's always a bit sad for me to think how common they used to be and how you know you have to really work for them now um, the area also has sand grouse uh, the beautiful pintail sand grouse Mostly see these in flight uh, and calling. Sometimes I managed to find some on the ground. Um, that's an absolutely beautiful picture by David. Um, and black-bellied sand grouse as well. So two species of sand grouse in the area, as well as red-legged partridge. And we'll certainly hear a lot of um, common quail. They're quite tricky to see, but usually with, with some effort, we manage to to get views of one. It takes a while sometimes. These grasslands also are very good for Iberian uh, subspecies of yellow wagtail and birds like the black-eared wheat ear. This is the pale-throated form. Uh, more normal is actually a black-throated form, um, but you get both in, in the area and you should see both. Then as we get to the edge of the grasslands, we start getting some oak trees and we get a mixture of cork oaks and holm oaks. And we get a, a very unique habitat. You get these incredibly diverse grasslands and then the, the scattered oaks, which are called dehesas. Um, and this area is the most biodiverse ecosystem in Europe. And it has fantastic orchids, butterflies, uh, reptiles as well. This is a Spanish festoon, one of the speciality butterflies of the area. And I mean, this is what this habitat looks like from up on a ridge looking out over it. And you can see scattered oak trees across a, a plain with grasslands underneath it. And this is the area there where a lot of the fighting bulls are raised. They also uh, graze pigs under them that eat the acorns and produce the famous black leg ham as they call it. Um, 
so it's a very interesting ecosystem. It's a very interesting sort of economic model, actually. That, that plus the, so the, the fighting bulls that have and the cork make this more profitable. Take any one of those three things away, and it would be better to have wheat monoculture on its habitat. So it's it's a perhaps a threatened ecosystem, but um, a very important one. And it's also a a sort of pseudo natural habitat. So um, you get this Mediterranean scrub that has really been cleared since the Roman times in this area, but most of the species have adapted to this habitat. So this is a black winged or black shouldered kite, uh, a young bird, European roller that breeds quite often in nest boxes now because cavities are are getting scarce in some places so we'll check out some nest boxes for them. Uh, beautiful birds like Melodious Warbler, Great Spotted Cuckoo, uh, a specialist on uh, nest parasite, ne specialist nest parasite of a uh, European magpie. Um, so they're again they're an early breeder so we're getting a bit late for them but we usually manage to find one or two their numbers fluctuate greatly from year to year they they kind of have a cycle with the magpies and move that cycle sort of goes in waves geographically across spain um so sometimes it's a bit tricky and other years it's, it's a bit easier and european bees they are recently in when we're there and there must be millions in extremadura at this time of year and they are absolutely fantastic. They're entertaining to watch. They've got a fantastic little call as they go over. They're relatively um, uh, okay with you getting quite close for photos. They tend to sit in nice places in bright sunlight. Um, brilliant birds. And they'll be uh, abundant daily where we are. Just to the north of the plains, there's the uh, Montfragway National Park. And here you can see more natural Mediterranean scrub, one of the remnants. And then down below, you can see the dehaces and you can see how it kind of, you can see how they look like each other. So, but because the scrub's a bit thicker here and a bit more diverse, there's a number of other birds here. We'll, we'll find probably some of our first uh, nightingales here, which will be a common sound from here north as we move through Spain. Uh, sometimes tricky to see, but with a bit of effort, we usually find one or two that are sitting in slightly more exposed perches to get a good look at. Um, this is also an area where Cinereus vulture um, nests. They, they're a tree breeding vulture and they nest in the, the trees along the ridge there. I'm afraid that's the only picture I've got and it was terrible heat haze. Um, it was the heat of the day in on a private trip in July. So um, there's a, a big cliff that we look across at that has a large colony of griffin vultures. We will have already seen a few of these down in the Straits of Gibraltar, but they will now be going to become a, a daily feature and we're going to go past several big breeding colonies. Uh, this area also probably will give us our first chance at seeing Egyptian vulture. This is another bird that has declined, sadly, over recent years. But there's a, a reasonable population um, here, a few pairs in the park, and hopefully we'll get some good looks at this, this beautiful little vulture. Also, perhaps our first chance is at seeing Benelli's eagle, quite a scarce eagle. Uh, nests in in big cliffs and canyons and we usually make a special effort to find it here. Montfragüe National Park probably is the best place for watching raptors in the whole of Europe from the number of species there. Um, as we got to these rocky areas we also get a number of species that are specialized in in rocky outcrops but often also found around towns like the Black Red Start, Crag Martin, Blue Rock Thrush, Rock bunting, surely the only bird with a scientific name named after a spy agency in the world. Uh, and we will also make an effort one evening to try and seek out eagle owl. This is, there's a several pairs in the park. 
Uh, this is a young one that you have found and we may see young ones um, because they breed quite early in the season or we may see adults, um, but usually we make several evening dusk trips to, to get good views of this. This is also one of our first chances to see hawfinch. Um, always quite a low density bird, but sometimes can be found coming down to uh, pools drinking in the park. We will have further chances further north. And hopefully we're usually just got the first redneck night jars in. Again, they're a late migrant, but usually the tour just allows us to get uh, the first couple in. And hopefully if you get a warm night, if you get a cold night, then it's a bit more tricky. But if you get a warm night, then we can end up getting views like this of this beautiful large night jar. The scrubby areas here also have firecrest and this will become a, a fairly regular bird for us as we go further north. We may have even seen it on the extension in the oak forest further south, um, sometimes even in the hotel garden there. But um, we'll make good efforts to get good views of this because it's easy just to, to hear them on a sort of daily basis. And there's also several breeding pairs of Spanish Imperial Eagle. Spanish Imperial Eagle at one point was the, uh, considered to be the rarest bird of prey in the world in the 70s. Fortunately, they have um, come back quite well. They're doing pretty well. And there are several hundred pairs now in Spain and we should see several views of this. There's a nest uh, regularly in Monfragüe National Park quite near to um, where we watch for the eagle owls and things. Monfragua is also particularly good for seeing uh, Eurasian otter because there's a big river running through the middle of it and often we're looking across the river to look for the owls and eagles and things. And looking down, you can often see Eurasian otter, which is one of my favorite animals. Then we, leaving Monfragua, we go slightly further north and we come up to the Sierra de Gredos, which is covered in Iberian oak forest, which is gonna give us uh, a whole bunch of new species, things like Iberian, uh, the Iberian form of pied fly catcher, another chance for Iberian chiff chaff, rye neck, et cetera. But we really here to look for a few birds. Um, one is autumn bunting. Again, it's another late migrant, but we're usually just about the right time to get the first few in in the broom at sort of mid elevations on rocky hillsides. Uh, this is a, sadly a, a bird that has declined enormously across Europe through persecution and habitat uh, lost. But um, there's quite a good population on the Sierra de Gredos. And then we get right up to the top of the Sierra de Gredos and we look in the, the broom up here that won't be in flower yet, looking right across to the high snowy peaks. Um, and we come and we look for this uh, blue throat the, with the, this form in Spain that doesn't have a throat spot at all. And uh, we can usually find it singing from the top of one of these broom bushes in the afternoon sun. Absolutely fantastic. We then head north to the central plateau to the steppe, uh, the herb steppes. And we've got one really important target here, the Iberian form of Dupont's lark. There are two subspecies of this, one only found in Morocco. Uh, well, I think it's actually in Morocco and Algeria and one found only in Spain. And it's, it's amazingly difficult to see at times. It's call cool, seems to be ventriloquial. It's quite, the habitat's often quite windy and you just can't tell where it's calling from. They can be incredibly shy, um, but usually with persistence and being out there right on, right at first light, um, we, we look for this bird and uh, usually are successful in, in getting quite good looks at Dupont's lark. One thing about first light in Spain is that um, the Spanish are very civilized and have moved their time zone right back across to central European time. So it doesn't get light very early. There's none of those 5 a.m. starts, um, anything like that. What you do get is quite late, long, light evenings, which is also very nice. So sometimes we go birding after dinner or even take a, a, a field dinner. Um, but yeah, you don't have ridiculously early starts. So it makes it a very good trip for 
uh, spouses, partners, friends who are perhaps not quite so keen on the 5 a.m. starts, um, etc. So as we drive north from, from there towards the Pyrenees, we'll try and stop in at a couple of lakes um, uh, with some reed beds and look for birds like this, uh, bearded tit, which obviously now it's in its own family, is very sought after by many family listers. Uh, it's only breeds in extreme northern Spain, but there are a couple of places where we can usually, usually find it with a bit of luck. Uh, we also, the same areas often have penduline tit, which is also a beautiful one to see. I actually saw four two days ago, about 20 miles from my house here in the UK, which is really rare. But uh, uh, These wetland areas are also quite good often for European hobby or Eurasian hobby. Um, they are just come in and they're there taking dragonflies over the wetlands. And always entertaining to watch. We'll also stop at some rocky outcrops for black wheat here. Uh, black wheat is a really interesting bird. I mean, it's, it's nice to look at, but it also, um, they just lay their eggs in a little um, depression in a little rock cave on a cliff. And um, so that as they don't have to build the nest, the female demands of the male that he carries lots of little pebbles from the bottom of the cliff up to beside the nest. So in the nest cavities, you find these little sort of piles of, of rocks and they've got to be big enough until she'll say, right, you've put in the effort. Now I, I can see you've got commitment and they'll breed. So a uh, lovely bird to watch. And occasionally you see one flying around with a little pebble. But then we arrive in the Pyrenees and we've been working our way up to, to the Pyrenees and we start over in the west um, looking in the forests of the Pyrenees, the beech forests. I don't actually have a very good photo. I'm afraid it, my only photos of this area are on are old slides. But um, so the beech forest, you can see the beech here, the, the brighter green towards the bottom. And we'll spend a couple of days in this area looking for uh, especially white back woodpecker, and some of the other woodpeckers and things. I don't have a photo, I'm afraid, of the right subspecies of whiteback woodpecker, so I didn't put it in. Um, but that's a, a big attraction. It's an endemic subspecies to the Pyrenees. Um, there are also pine forests a little higher up, and these areas will give us a chance at things like some, some more, more northern birds from Europe, really. Things like um, Eurasian tree creeper, um, I'll also get crested tits in here, uh, gold crest, um, and perhaps the, the big wo European woodpecker, the black woodpecker, and make a special effort to seek them out, often heard with their far carrying calls, but it usually takes a little bit of a while to get one close enough that we can go and see it. Then we go up into the high Pyrenean valleys, these lovely Andean valleys, incredible if you're interested in alpine flowers and things there's orchids and all sorts of great alpine flora um, but there's also some, some really good birds at lower elevations we find redback shrike again quite a late migrant um, but usually just in for the last couple of days of the tour um, they do a crazy migration they don't cross at gibraltar they go right round through israel and then through the alps and drop back down into spain um, so, uh, common red start is breeding in this area, in the deciduous woodlands. White-throated dipper along the mountain streams. And then we'll, we'll look at the real high Pyrenees. There will still be quite a lot of snow at this time of year. Um, and we'll go up on one of the highest passes and we have a picnic lunch and you Usually these guys, alpine chuffs, come and, and wait for any breadcrumbs that might have been dropped. And we're in that area and we're looking for um, alpine accenta and also um, white winged snow finch. This area also is, is where we're going to first start seeing our bearded vultures or lammergeier is another great success story. It used to be very rare, the population is doing very well now and they've increased in the Pyrenees and we should see several of these 
They're really impressive birds. But one of the, the real specialities we're going to look out for is going to be wall creeper. And we go to places like this and um, depending on from year to year where, where they've been seen, uh, they're a very late breeder. So they are literally just starting to, to get onto territory when we're there. Um, two years ago, we had an absolutely fantastic paired display flight that I'd never seen before, singing in the air, the, the male and the female kind of spinning around each other, absolutely phenomenal. So we go places like this, Garganta the Diablo, the Devil's Throat, and we look for, here's a, here's a female with the whiter head, and here's a, a male with the black throat, and we look for these hitching up the, the cliffs. Uh, it can be a, a slightly strange almost hallucinatory experience when you're searching and searching the cliffs for them because you kind of lose the scale i find a cliff what you're looking for and suddenly you'll find you're looking at a cliff 200 meters away and the wall creeper would have to be about this big <laughs> for you to be able to see it because you've you've just you've, through the telescope gone too far away and you have to kind of keep drawing yourself back in and and searching but usually with a, with a bit of luck and a bit of perseverance we managed to get some some great views of of wall creeper which is always very nice so that's and then we end up heading down to barcelona where we've got a little bit of time for some stuff on the coast but it's similar birds to what we had down in the south um so i just want to make you aware of the the coming upcoming tours for 2021 and 2022 uh, the itinerary I've described is the birding tour and Paul Varney's leading the tour next year, uh, just in five months time. And there are two spaces available. I'm fortunate to be leading the 2022 tour and there are quite a few spaces available. But there's also the Birds, Wine and Lynx tour, which Keith will be leading in 2021 and Holly will be leading in 2022. So they're all great options if you're inspired to bird Spain. I'll just come back and say a little bit more about the sort of general tour again. We stay in some really beautiful hotels. We stay, we eat in some fantastic restaurants. There's, the food's brilliant. There's great local wine if you like a glass of wine in the evening. Uh, in Spain, actually, when you get a, a meal, wine is automatically included. If you don't want wine, you have to say, can I have something else to drink, please? Um, so, uh, which is slightly frustrating for us drivers who have to keep turning down the delicious wine. Um, but no, there's great birds. It's very civilized because of the times of day. There's great, really beautiful buildings that we stay in. We see some great archeology, span some great history. We might see, you know, we drive past a 2000 year old aqueduct and things like that, uh, built by the Romans at Segovia. It, it really is an incredible country. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I hope some of you are excited. I'd just like to thank all the other guides who've shared their photos for this tour, talk with me. Um, many of them have, have guided this tour or been on this tour. It really is a fantastic place. And thank you for listening. I hope I might see some of you in May. Oh, sorry, that should be 2022. I'm on 22. Um, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, fantastic thanks, Rob. Rob um yeah very very special indeed what a what a wonderful part of the world Spain is I think you really captured the uh a lot of the essence of it with those with those photographs and it was wonderful to see some of the scenery as well and I think it really helped to to put everybody in Spain for a for a 45 minutes there or so um really wonderful job and uh yeah spectacular uh, I know a lot of people um, I'm very keen to, to hear what camera you're using and, and that sort of thing. But Nikki will deal with that in the, in the Q&A that's coming up. Um, I, just, I just quickly wanted to send a, a massive shout out to two ladies who have joined us for, amazingly, all 27 webinars that we've done. Susan Fallon and, uh, and Jean Byer, thank you so much, ladies. Um, your support has been massively appreciated and, and really heartfelt. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> quite incredible um, to, yeah, to have joined us for all 27. Um, we've had a, had a serious variety going on uh, during it all. And uh, I know there's lots of people who have done 25 and 26 as well. Nikki's got all the stats. Um, Nikki and I are certainly the, 
stats stats junkies. We've got a few of them in the office, but uh, Nikki puts it all together. And uh, but there's a lot of you that have joined us for a lot of webinars, and and yeah, I want to thank you all as well. Um, so quickly before we get stuck into Q and A, just another reminder: um, if you've joined us, you know, a little bit later, I know sometimes. Uh, you only pop on at about three or four minutes past, so you might have missed my introduction. Just to let you know again that we are taking a break. Uh, this is the last webinar for the year, but uh, we will be coming back. We will have webinars once again from the 6th of January, and uh, Lev Fred will be doing that one featuring Canada's Northern Owl. So just a reminder there that this is certainly not the last webinar. Uh, we will definitely be back in 2021. Um, and then just a reminder that the webinars are again recorded and can be viewed later. Uh, the link's available again within the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, and you can also go to our website and YouTube and see uh, see a lot of the past webinars that have been done, uh, all the guides and and their tales around yeah, various exciting uh, parts of the world. And then finally, um, just before I hand over to Nikki, again, these uh, webinars are all being offered free of charge. Uh, but should you wish to donate towards our tour leaders, the GoFundMe link, is still open and 100% of those proceeds go directly to our tour leaders. Um, yeah, thank you so much all from my side. Uh, Nikki, over to you and Rob for some Q&A. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and I see Paul Varney is also online and he's saying, looking forward to leading the tour in May. Rob, Spain has some superb birding. So thanks for being online, yeah, Paul. Um, First Q&A question we've got coming in is, uh, I would like to know which parts of Donane are included in the tour? Um, Doniana National Park, we, how we do it depends on the water levels because every year is different and the water levels are different. So we don't usually do go into the main bit of the, the national park because you have to go in a park vehicle, and you can only get out at certain places. So we tend to skirt around the edge. There's some publicly accessible places with, with blinds, that, with trails that you can walk looking over marshes. Um, there's some areas of woodland I know we can go and walk in. So we, we tend to sort of go around the edge of the national park. There's a national park and a natural park. We tend to use more the natural park because you can more or less go where you like. But exactly where we go depends completely on the water level at the time we visit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Susan um, asks, what camera are you using for these beautiful photos? Um, well, I, th they're taken actually over quite a few years. Um, so I've used a variety of cameras. Right now, I'm using a Nikon D500 with the 500 millimeter PF lens. Um, uh, but none of these photos were taken with that because I hadn't got that what last time I was in Spain. I've only only had that a year and a bit. Um, uh, so I, I was using Nikon. I mean, this, this bit of vulture that's up now, I think that was a Nikon with the 200, 500 uh, zoom on it. Yeah. Uh, probably probably the d500 but i i would have to check in my photo database uh, to be absolutely certain rob i know you can't see any of the the comments in the chat so i will send all the kind comments that are coming through there's so many beautiful messages so like thank i always do every webinar is i'll send it by email and thank you to everyone for all the beautiful messages um uh, Jennifer is, uh, is saying, um, I have been hiking in Spain and now very interested in doing your Spain bird tour. Thank you again for all of these much appreciated vaccine on the horizon now. Uh, then we will all return to bird trips with you. Thank you. So Jennifer, absolutely agree with you there. Um, Ricky is saying, any idea on the causes of the little uh, busted decline? Is it habitat loss or, you know, usually it's that. Um, anyone working in support of the species? Yes, there are several people working on it. Actually, Yoav Perlman, one of the rock jumper tour leaders, did his PhD on bustards in the, the Spanish steppes and things. So he's the person to talk to. But yeah, basically it's agricultural intensification. Um, there may be some other factors as well. Um, I personally, I haven't heard much about this one, but I wonder if there seem to be a lot of 
uh, electricity towers and the sort of uh, planted up shelter belts out in the steppe area now. And you see a lot of raptors sitting up high. And I've, I've watched one, uh, I've watched the Spanish Imperial Eagle try to take a little bustard from a perch gliding. And that would have been impossible until those perches were out there. So that, yeah. that kind of, when I saw that, I suddenly thought, oh, I wonder if that's, but I, I mean, that's just sort of anecdotal in myself. But yeah, I think it's basically agricultural intensification. Um, uh, loss of uh, the insects that they need for their, their yeah. chicks and then probably habitat in winter. In winter, they get together in big flocks and that may also have, um, have been yeah. lost. Absolutely. Um, but there are several reserves now to try and protect the habitat and where there are payment schemes where they're paying landowners to manage the, the habitat yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Jennifer is saying, uh, what are the usual dates for the trip? please i know you did put that up um, um yep. but maybe if you can just uh, show that again and um you know if yep. if those don't, dates don't fit your your time frame we always do have our tailor-made departments that can also um uh, put trips together that are slightly out of those dates so maybe if you can just show those any any other dates that um you might be a good time to to travel there yeah, I mean, th this tour is run 5th to 19th of May, and that's really designed for the, so the pre-tour extension is just before that, and that's the first few days of May is the peak honey buzzard passage, and it's also when the, the first white rump swifts are in, the first rufous tail bush, uh, scrub robins are back, um, you know, by the time we get up to northern Spain, the, you know, towards the end of May, redback shrike should be in. So it is a right on that balance of trying to get those birds arriving, but still some of the waders there, yeah. et cetera. But you can do, you can do this trip anytime between March and uh, end of May. After right. middle of June, it's getting pretty hot uh, yeah. in Cota Doñana and Extremadura. I mean, you can even do the south right through in, in the winter, but then the Pyrenees is a bit um, snowy. So it's, it's, it's a balancing act. But yeah, as Nikki yeah. says, if anyone wants to go at any other time, I'd, I'd put my hand up as a volunteer to, to guide trips anytime to Spain. Oh, absolutely. And, and uh, Robert says lovely photos with mouth-watering water, descriptions. Are there ever tie-ins with tours to Morocco um, at all? Um, that might be able to uh, piggyback off those going to Spain um, and then Morocco. I, I don't know. You could certainly do a trip that did Morocco and Spain. Um, it would become a very long trip if you wanted to do both countries correctly and, mm -hmm. and properly. So I think that's probably why it doesn't. It would probably be too long for most people. Um, but again, if you wanted a custom trip, you could do a sort of 10 day Morocco, 10 day Spain. But in, in 10 days, you can't do, you know, you can't do the whole of Spain like we're trying to do um, yeah. and really have chance to, see, to seek out these more tricky species. Um, just to, I forgot to give the total number. Normally the main tour gets about 230 to 260 species. And the uh, extension, the Straits of Gibraltar extension gets about 150, 160 species. Um, another question is, you mentioned the Caledonian pine forest. Are the Spanish trees planted or introduced? No, they're native. It's the same species. Um, it, perhaps I did wonder when I put it up, should I be saying Caledonian pine forest? Because that to me is really what's in Scotland, but it is Caledonian <laughs> pine. If, you're, if you go to Scotland, it's called the Caledonian pine. It's the same tree species. Oh. Um, obviously has been spread down in the last glaciation in Europe. And there's, there's the same species up at higher elevations in the Pyrenees and also found in places in the Alps and things. Um, Karen saying, where does Arte Latino come from in Spain? I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Arte, where does what? Um, Arte Latino. Arte Latino uh, come from in Spain. Maybe it's something that uh, we both uh, didn't hear. Yeah, I'm not sure quite what. 
what what she means, I'm afraid. Maybe, Corin, if you can just send in a, another message just to explain that one um, for us. Or I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly on my side. Um, then we've got uh, Johnny over here that's saying, if you have a non-birding spouse, sounds like the food, wine, and architecture could keep them happy while uh, we are in birding, which you did mention. So very exciting. And, and if you didn't hear that, it is a great trip to take um, with a spouse that doesn't bird. Um, can you please elaborate on the other Spain tours? Yes, yeah, so the, the main other tour is the Birds, Wine and Lynx tour. And that basically, uh, if I remember rightly, it, it go, I've never, it, you know, it's a new offering. It's a 10 day tour. It goes to Monfragüe, Coto Doñana, and then it comes back up into uh, the Sierra de Anduja, which is a sort of central southern Spain, slightly east. Um, and that's the place to look for lynx. That's an amazing, it's a national park with several roads going through it. Very, very, very quiet roads, sort of one vehicle every three or four hours. And they're usually another lynx watcher. Um, absolutely beautiful place. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a few centers. It's a smaller circuit and it runs in winter because that's the time to see the links. So yeah. there you will see, you will see the bustards and things. Um, they won't be displaying, but you will also see things like cranes, which we don't see on this trip because most of the European population from Scandinavia, Germany, Poland, etc., of common crane, a huge number of them go down to Extremadura and actually walk around eating the acorns under those oaks in the Dehesas and oh, also wow. go to the rice fields and things. So you see huge yeah. numbers of cranes there on, on that winter trip. Um, Janet says beautiful photos. Is hunting a problem with bird conservation in Spain? Yes and no. It, it was much worse. It is getting better. There is still some hunting of migratory birds that is actually illegal under EU law now. Um, and there's a, this is a problem throughout the Mediterranean, actually, as, my, as birds migrate through. Um, and there's, there's a great little organization called CABS, um, which are working to stop that. And uh, they go and using satellite images, try to spot the netting sites um, and then go and intervene during the season and get, get it stopped. And so, and hopefully attitudes are changing, but yes, in Spain, one of the things you'll see a lot is these black and white signs that are about that big, black and white diagonally split, and they're on fence posts. And people often go, what does that mean? And that means it's private hunting, because if you don't have those up, anyone can go in and hunt there. And so even, so a friend of mine who bought a piece of land for conservation there had to have these up around it. He never did any hunting, but he had to do it. Otherwise he would, and he still occasionally found people in there. Um, but I don't think it's a problem for things like the bustards now, um, etc. It's it's more the small migrant songbirds. Bob, Bob is wondering if there is uh, any time on the tour to visit any um, archaeological sites or beautiful churches uh, nearby. There's a little bit of time. We we can do a few um, things that are in our villages. Sometimes, so like Trujillo, we make some time. Normally we have lunch in the town square there and then have a couple of hours walking around the town. And some people are mostly looking at the birds. Other people are mostly looking at the architecture. Some people have even been to visit the Pizarro Museum. Uh, there's a castle up at the top we walk around, etc. Um, yeah, there's a little bit of time, but it also, um, several people have done this on previous tours, is arrive a few days early in Seville and have some time around Seville. The cathedral there is absolutely mind-boggling. Um, the, the old tower where the gold from South America used to come in and things, a beautiful, beautiful city. Yeah. Um, someone on my last tour, she'd hired a car and driven over to Granada for a couple of days yeah. uh, on her own before the tour. And then at the end, we finish up in Barcelona and often people stay a day or two in Barcelona to see the Sagrada Familia and, and things. And some people then also get the, um, get the train to uh, Madrid and um, you can get these high-speed trains. They're incredibly good. 
to uh, Madrid and have a day or two in Madrid. So you can you can pack more culture around it quite easily. And do you have a favorite bird guidebook? Uh, yes, I like, I did remember to get it nearby. <laughs> I like the Collins Bird Guide uh, for Europe. It is also available as a very good app. On, if you prefer an app on your phone, and I, I think this is a, a very good one at the moment. Um, so it's a few years old now, but it's still my go-to. Um, though I do have a shelf with quite a few other ones on as well. <laughs> um, any chance of seeing broad-billed sandpiper? From no, last year? not unless it was a, an extreme vagrant. Their migratory route is much further to the east. Um, so no... I've never seen broad-billed sandpiper in Spain. And harriers? Uh, harriers, we should see definitely Montague's harrier and Western Marsh harrier. Um, we have seen hen harrier and I've once seen pallid harrier, but they're pretty rare. I mean, hen harrier winters, but they're mostly gone by then. Um, but Montague's harrier, certainly, I just couldn't put all 250 birds we see on a tour in their photos. And I didn't have a particularly good photo of a Montague's Harrier. Um, and Western Marsh Harrier, we should see both those. Oh, brilliant. Uh, I have a big smile on my face because Corinne's come back and she said it's actually her favorite champagne. <laughs> and uh, the, the word that we, you know, the, the comment from earlier. So it was her favorite champagne that she was mentioning and how much fun it would be going to the winery. I definitely agree, uh, Corinne, for sure. Where are the bald ibis uh, specifically? They're right down uh, in the south, uh, near a town called Babate. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of colonies now. Um, uh, yeah, so from, from our hotel in, uh, on the extension, it's about, I don't know, 40 minute drive north. Um, yeah. And um, how much walking and over what type of terrain do you expect? Generally speaking, it's um, quite easy walking along uh, tracks, uh, sandy paths, etc. The one exception can be the wall creeper. Wall creepers, some years they're in some places, other years they're in other places. And uh, I know two years ago, Tom Tomas was leading the tour and he saw the wall creeper at a site where we used to see them but they hadn't been there for several years when I was leading the trips and so we'd had to do about a two to three kilometer walk um, gently up through a pine forest it's quite easy apart from the last hundred meters is a little bit steep um, but then we so everyone went apart one lady decided she, she was really a non-birding spouse she decided she would rather hang out uh, down near the, the vehicles and so we left her a key in case it rained or something for one of the vehicles and she spent her time hanging out with the mountain ponies and taking photos of scenery and things um, but everyone else who wanted to go up or walked up and um, because there are two leaders um, usually one leader goes to the beginning to start looking for the wall creeper and the other brings up the rear and make sure everyone gets up there and um, you know we normally we're sitting there for a couple of hours till we've all seen at the wall creeper well so it's it's a few kilometers over a, a long morning basically i've got uh, time for two more questions um linda says you mentioned that several vulture species are increasing is that a result of more food uh, due to human activity a, a example uh, like uh, ranching uh yes in a way it is the um it used to be there were regulations that, that dead animals had to be buried or burnt for food hygiene reasons. And in Spain, they changed that so they could leave the carcasses out. And this has benefited vultures. So globally, vultures are doing very badly, uh, uh, especially the gyps vultures, um, because of various things. But, um, but in Spain, it's the sort of good news story that the populations of Cyneris vulture uh, the Lamagaya or bearded vulture and the griffon vulture, they're, they're all increasing. The Egyptian vulture is, is declining slightly. Yeah. 
And would it be possible to spend a day or two looking for links after or before the May tour, or is November a better time to see links? Um, yeah, the winter is a bit better. Um, you can do it, and I have seen them in May. You could certainly do it. I, I would recommend to do it before. I think if you waited till afterwards, it would be getting too hot down there. But if you did it in the end of April, you could certainly do it. And I have seen them in the, I have seen them on a, on a beginning of May tour um, a few years ago, which went, to, that was a private tour I arranged with someone and it went through the Sierra de Anduja and we did see links there. So, I mean, the very best time is probably March at dawn because then they're calling. Yeah. Um, but, but in the winter, through till about April's fine. When it gets a bit hot, then they become more nocturnal, I think. Oh, thank you, Rob. We really enjoyed that. Great, great virtual tour. Thank you for taking us. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. And thanks, guys, for letting me do the last one of the year. And yeah, uh, very special, Rob. Yeah, absolutely. So from all of us, from the Rock Jumper team, have a wonderful festive season. And thank you. And see you in 2021. Happy holidays, everyone. Cheers. Bye. Bye.